I sat alone in my dark living room, waiting for the drugs to kick in. With my back against one bare wall, I looked around my new house. A small two-bedroom rental on a quiet street in a neighborhood far away from anywhere I'd ever been. There were a few boxes in the living room, most of them holding brand new items like lamps and yet to be assembled side tables and other household necessities for the modern suburbanite. The only light was from the street light outside, streaming through the half-closed shades. The bed I'd ordered had been delivered earlier, but it still sat in cardboard boxes. I had put off setting the bed up, thinking vaguely about suicide. I didn't want to live like this, but I had little choice. The bottle of Xanax was near to my hand, and I contemplated taking another pill. It wouldn't kill me, not one more, not even close, but it would help me sleep through the night. Only I would be groggy and unable to wake up if I needed to during the night. And I wasn't ready to let my guard down like that. I wasn't sure if I would ever be ready for that. Next to the pill bottle sat a pistol. I stared at it for a long time until the sound of a car engine pulled my attention toward the living room window. I expected the car to pass by. I could see the glow from the headlights and I could hear the engine clearly through the single pane windows. Getting stiffly to my feet and grabbing the pistol, I stepped over to the window and looked out at the street. A dark Dodge Charger idled in front of my house. The windows were tinted, preventing me from seeing the driver or any passengers that might have been in there. My pulse quickened and I wondered if they'd found me. But it wasn't possible. I had a new name, a new identity, I was someone else entirely, and it was only my first night in the house. There was no way they could have found me so quickly. The vehicle pulled slowly away. Given my angle, I only caught a glimpse of the license plate, not enough to get the full number. I stood at the window, looking out at the quiet street for several minutes. Then I shut the shades and double-checked that the doors were locked. Then I settled back down on the floor, my back against the wall. The drugs were finally kicking in, allowing me to relax. I leaned my head back against the wall and closed my eyes. I slept in fits and starts, never once letting go of the gun throughout the night. I parked the Bronco a block away from the elementary school at 2.20 in the afternoon. I was still getting used to the new-to-me vehicle, the squeaky brakes, the worn-out shocks and the uncomfortable seats. But it was all I could afford. I killed the engine, but didn't get out. After taking a Xanax, I pulled out my burner phone and did a quick search. First, looking for national news on my name. My old name, anyway. There was only a small piece about how the manhunt was still ongoing. I knew I had to be careful. For all I knew, the feds had my son under observation, just in case I tried to approach him. After the national search, I did a local search to see what was happening in this new town of mine. There wasn't much to speak of. A man had been killed by police. There had been a stabbing at a local nightclub. A gas station had been robbed. Pretty normal stuff. I set the phone down and glanced toward the school. Something caught my eye in my rearview mirror. I did a double take, looking at the dark sedan parked half a block behind me. It hadn't been there when I pulled up, had it? Maybe it was the feds, trying to get a positive ID on me before they came swooping in. I glanced toward the school again and decided it wasn't worth the risk. No matter how badly I wanted to see my son, to check on him, to see him from afar to verify that he was alive and doing okay with his new family. No matter how badly I wanted that, I wanted to stay out of prison just as badly. I started the Bronco up and pulled out of my parking spot, cruising past the school just as kids started pouring out the doors, done for the day. A glance in the rearview mirror showed me that the dark sedan was following. My eyes darted down to the glove compartment, where my pistol was. If it was the feds, I would have to give myself up. But it wasn't. I headed across town, 
losing the dark Dodge Charger along the way. By the time I got back to the house, I was sure I was being paranoid. If the feds were watching me, I wouldn't know it. And who else would be after me? After parking the Bronco in the garage, I decided to set up the bed. My back and neck were hurting from sleeping against the wall last night. Two Xanax and several hours later, it was dark outside and I found myself sitting in the living room again, staring, waiting, thinking incessantly, yet somehow not thinking at all. My mind was socked in with a dark, impenetrable fog. Once again, I heard the bass rumble of a car engine approaching and then stopping, idling. I stood up and moved to the window, glancing out. The Dodge Charger sat threateningly in front of my house. The car pulled away slowly. I watched it go. As soon as it was gone, I rushed to my bedroom and dug my prepaid phone out of my half-unpacked duffel bag. I called a number for memory. Hey, Mr. Myers, a man's voice said from the other end of the line. How's your new identity treating you? I could tell by the smile in his voice that he was to blame for those men in the dark sedan. A blast furnace door opened inside of me, releasing a wave of scorching fury. I only knew him as Mr. Fixit, because that was the name on his dark website. What did you do? I asked in a growl. Me? I didn't do anything. You're the one who's living under an assumed name. It's just, that name may not be as squeaky clean as I led you to believe. I checked it out myself, I said, not understanding how this happened. I'm sure you did, Mr. Fixit said, still a smile in his voice. But that's just the thing. You're not a world-class hacker, are you? Because if you were, you would have seen more than I wanted you to see. As it stands, you're pretty f my friend. Whoever's on to you isn't going to stop. Unless... Unless what? You want more money? <laughs> Mr. Fixit laughed. Smart man, Mr. Myers. That's exactly what I want. And if I get $10,000 from you in the next 10 minutes, I can make your troubles go away. How would you do that? What guarantee do I have that you can even do it? Uh, no guarantee, he said. None at all. But I do guarantee that you'll have some serious problems if you don't pay the money. So what do you... I hung up the phone and threw it across the room. I didn't have $10,000 to give him. I'd spent most of my money setting up this new identity, which was apparently compromised. Although I didn't know exactly how. Whoever was in the sedan wasn't the feds. That much was clear. So who were they? I didn't want to stick around and find out. Moving quickly, I started grabbing essential items and stuffing them into my duffel bag, trying to clear my head. I set my gun down on the kitchen counter when I'd come home earlier. Thinking I should have it on me, I headed out to the kitchen. But my gun wasn't where I'd left it. I looked around, trying to remember if I'd even brought it in from the car. I could have sworn I had but I'd taken too much Xanax. It was messing with my head. As I stalked into the living room, I saw a dark figure standing in the corner of the room. I whipped my head in that direction and saw a man dressed in black and wearing a rubber Chucky mask from the Child's Play movies. He held up my gun between thumb and forefinger, as if to say, looking for this. I turned around to run and came face to face with another man dressed in an identical mask. He jammed a handheld stun gun into the flesh of my neck before I could react. As thousands of volts flowed through me, my muscles contracted and I went stiff, then fell over, unable to even reach a hand out to cushion my fall. I could still feel the man's neck under my hands as I strangled the life out of him. The feel of the taut, wire-like tendons standing out under my palms and fingers. The bulbous lump of his Adam's apple bobbing faintly as he tried to suck in a breath. And finally, the feel of those tendons fading back under the skin, his Adam's apple moving no more. Revenge had been the only thing driving me ever since my wife was killed in a robbery. I had been out of town at the time, and our son Andrew had fallen sick. My wife, Trisha, went out in the middle of the night to get him some medicine, and she never returned. Of course, I never would have known who had killed her were it not for some anonymous source inside the police department. One day, not long after the murder, 
I got a call from a man who was using some sort of device to change his voice. He explained to me that they knew who had killed my wife. He was a valuable confidential informant and would likely trade information for a lesser sentence. He'll probably be out in 15 years, the guy on the phone said. And that didn't sit right with him. It didn't sit right with me either. So the man on the phone explained to me that they knew where the guy was holed up and that they were planning to arrest him in a couple of hours when they got all the warrants in order. It was just enough time, he said, for someone to get over there and give the guy the death sentence he deserved. I didn't hesitate, didn't think twice about it. I went to the address the mystery man on the phone gave me and I killed the man who killed my wife. When I was done and the life was gone from him, I felt a lightness enter my chest. It lasted only a couple of hours until I realized that I would have to go on the run and that I would have to leave my son behind. Revenge had clouded my thoughts, making me think only of the short term. But I couldn't say I regretted killing that man, especially after he admitted he'd been the one to shoot up the convenience store. I didn't regret it, but that didn't stop me from seeing his face when I closed my eyes, from feeling his neck under my hands, from remembering the fury that overwhelmed me as I took his life. I was lost in the memory when something jostled me and I came painfully back to reality. I had just rolled into a wall. I opened my eyes to blackness, realizing I was moving. I was in the back of a moving truck. At least, that's what the floor and the cold metal wall felt like. And the fact that there were no windows supported the theory. I suddenly remembered the men in the Chucky masks who'd somehow gotten into my house. Where were they taking me? What had I done to these people? Nothing, I realized. This was Mr. Fixit's doing. I had known buying a new identity off the dark web was risky, but I had never imagined something like this. What was the end game here? Did they want money or did they want something else? My life, perhaps? The vehicle made another turn and I slid the opposite way, trying to steady myself with my hands. But they were bound in front of me with what felt like zip ties. My ankles were similarly bound. Warming to the back of the vehicle, I sat up and pressed myself against the rear door. I then pulled my knees up under my chin and worked with my bound hands to pull the zip ties around my ankles up as far as I could on my shins. In my year on the run, I devoted a lot of time to figuring out how to escape from zip ties and handcuffs. I just thought it would be the police putting them on me, not some mysterious masked men. With the zip ties biting into the skin of my shins a few inches above my ankles, I flexed my legs and yanked my knees apart as far as I could. The zip ties didn't break, so I did it again. This time, they snapped from the tension. My legs were free, but my wrists were still bound. And given the thickness of the ties, I didn't think simply yanking my hands apart would work. Luckily, my captors hadn't removed my shoes. I untied both my shoes so the laces were loose, but I didn't remove the laces or the shoes. With some effort, I fit the end of one lace through the space between my wrists and the zip tie. That done, I tied that lace to the one from my other shoe. The vehicle slowed and I paused in my work, listening. Then the moving van came to a stop, and the engine noise stopped. I thought, realizing I had to get this done quickly. I pulled my hands toward my head and pushed my feet away, creating tension on the zip tie with the taut shoelaces. Then I bicycled my legs, essentially turning my shoelaces into a saw. The van shook slightly as the two cab doors shut. I heard the sound of footsteps coming down the sides toward the back. I pulled harder with my hands and bicycled my feet faster, trying not to make too much noise. The sound of the door latch retracting came from just behind me as the zip tie snapped. My hands were free. With no time to untie my tied together shoes, I quickly levered them off even as the door started sliding up. As the door came up all the way, revealing two men in Chucky masks, I lunged toward them, whipping my tied together shoes at one of the men while crashing into the other one with all my 190 pounds. I hit the gritty, torn up asphalt hard. The guy I'd struck stumbled backward and tripped, hitting his head on the brick warehouse wall as he fell. The guy I'd hit with my shoes yanked his Chucky mask off, 
revealing the plump, enraged face of a middle-aged white guy. He reached behind his back as I scrambled up from the ground, and I could only imagine he was going for a gun. Maybe my gun. We were next to some kind of dilapidated warehouse, and there was a low wall behind the guy, partitioning off a ramp where semi-trucks would back in to load or unload cargo. As I scrambled up, I grabbed a handful of grit from the ground and threw it at his face as he backpedaled, still reaching behind his back, fumbling for whatever was there. He shut his eyes and turned his head as the grit hit him in the face. I took two steps and gave him a shove. The backs of his legs hit the low brick wall and he tumbled backward onto the truck ramp. I heard the sound of metal shifting as he hit. It wasn't what I had expected. After glancing over my shoulder to see that the first guy I'd hit wasn't moving, I stepped close and looked over the knee-high wall. Someone had piled up a bunch of rusty metal equipment and disassembled shelving, presumably from inside the warehouse. The guy had flipped over and landed face first on some of this stuff. And although I couldn't see the wounds, I could tell from the way he was twitching and sputtering that he was grievously injured. I could see my gun still stuck in his back waistband and thought about going down to get it. Then the choice was taken out of my hands as a vehicle came into view, headlights illuminating the U-Haul truck I'd been transported in. My gun was too far for me to reach without getting down next to the dying man so I turned and looked for an escape route. The first man I'd hit when jumping out of the truck still hadn't moved. His head was canted awkwardly against the side of the warehouse, next to a set of double doors. I wondered briefly if he was still alive. It was hard to tell with the Chucky mask still on his head. Thinking my best bet was to find something with which to defend myself, I ran to the double doors, not all that surprised to find that they were unlocked. I shut the doors behind me and locked them, knowing that whoever was out there likely had a key. Still, it would buy me some time. I then turned to face the dark warehouse. As I stepped deeper into the dark space, motion sensor lights came on, flooding the space with illumination. My eyes darted around the area, hardly believing what I was seeing. There were what I could only describe as torture stations placed around the space. One featured a table with straps on it and several water containers nearby along with a hand towel draped over the table. It was a waterboarding station. There was a metal chair bolted to the floor with leather straps affixed to the arms and legs. Blood stains marred the concrete around it. Next to the chair was a mobile workbench with various bloody tools on it. There was a similar chair further back with leather straps at the arms and front legs. But this chair had a hole cut in the seat and a sharp metal spike positioned below the hole. The spike was attached to a crank, so the torturer could turn the crank and make the spike go up. A wave of nausea threatened to topple me, but the sound of footsteps from outside the door helped me bite back the sickness. I ran into the space, looking in vain for a place to hide among the torture implements. The smell of death permeated the place, and I wondered if one of these men was Mr. Fixit. I had clearly been set up. As I ran past a mobile workbench, I grabbed a hammer and an ice pick. I made it to the back of the warehouse and through a rear door just as I heard the front door opening. Running out into the night, I considered my options. I could keep running, going into the woods surrounding the old warehouse. But that blast furnace door was still open inside me, the heat blaring out stronger than ever, now that my fear had dissipated and the Xanax had worn off. So there wasn't much to consider. I turned into the woods flanking the warehouse and made my way around to the front. I waited for 15 minutes in the back of the still running Dodge Charger. I saw a man in a Chucky mask run out from the front of the warehouse, looking around wildly. He had a gun in his right hand, and with his left hand, he yanked off the mask and peered into the darkness around the warehouse. The dark haired man in his 30s shouted expletives into the night. He looked down into the truck ramp and shouted again, clearly angry and panicked. Then, as he started toward the Charger, I ducked down into the darkness of the back seat, getting low in the footwells. I stayed low as he got inside. I waited for him to put the vehicle in gear because it was the only way to be sure he didn't have the gun in his hand any longer. Then I popped up from the back seat, wrapping my left hand around and grabbing his forehead while I pressed the ice pick to his neck with my right hand. Put the vehicle in park and shut the engine off, I said. When he hesitated, staring wide-eyed at me in the rearview mirror, 
I pushed the tip of the ice pick into his neck, enough to draw blood. Okay, okay, he cried and did what I said. Then he and I had a nice long conversation. I learned a lot from him. I learned about his relationship with Mr. Fixit and about how much he paid them for their snuff film services. It was a pretty brilliant way of doing things. After all, people who needed new identities wouldn't likely be missed by anyone else. They could disappear off the face of the earth without so much as a question asked. That's just what Mr. Fixit did. He sold people new identities for a hefty profit and then turned around and made snuff films with them, making even more money when he sold the films to other dark websites. So I got the truth out of the man in the charger, and although he never admitted it, I got the impression that he wasn't in it for the money. He liked making snuff films. He liked working for Mr. Fixit. When I was done, I got out of the charger with only a little bit of blood on my right hand. I siphoned gas from the sedan and used it to set the whole place on fire, including the charger. When I left, I did so in the U-Haul, the fire bright in the side mirrors. Now, it has been over two years since I took my first life. So far, I've removed four scumbags from the world, and there's about to be a fifth. I've been watching him for a month now, learning his schedule, noting his seemingly normal life. He has a full social life, with friends and a girlfriend and a nice house. No kids, thank God. I learned that on Fridays, he goes to dinner with his friends. And since his girlfriend works on Friday nights as an ER nurse, he goes home alone. That's where I'm waiting for him now, in his home. It's Friday night. I hear the car pull into the garage, and I stay still despite that revenge-fueled furnace blasting away inside. I hear the door to the garage open, and I hold my breath where I am, just inside the kitchen. When he steps into the kitchen, he reaches for the light switch. I grab his hand and press the barrel of my gun to his head. Hello, Mr. Fixit. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video.